Well, hello folks. Here we are, a week. A week has gone by and we're together again uh, for a message today from God's Word. Um, thank you so much for having me with you. It is a, a great blessing and an honor for me to, to stand here in the pulpit and to share with you uh, from the Word of God. And I hope that you are blessed and I hope that you are well today. And... Uh, and looking forward to hearing from God today. So let's begin, why don't we? Let me ask you a question right off, right off the start. How would you define hope? How would you define hope? Well, dictionary.com defines hope as, quote, the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. And the verb form with the object that is hoped or hoping is defined by dictionary.com as to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence or to believe, desire, or trust. But let me ask you the same question in a different way. How would you define hope from a biblical perspective? How would you define that? Well, according to GodQuestions.org, there are two kinds of hope. One is a worldly hope or a temporary hope. And then there's the biblical view of hope. That is the hope of believers. And the hope that is based on the temporal plane of, the, of, of this world, in other words, secular hope, is more often than not a subjective expectation. And this kind of subjective hope, for the most part, often does not consider the will of God. For example, one might say something like this. I hope that I don't get sick, or I hope that I get that job. So, worldly hope is hope located in temporary things. And along with it comes often doubt and uncertainty. Secular hope, a worldly hope, is often filtered through our personal biases and preferences and our experiences. And because of this, secular hope can be motivated often by selfishness and greed. But when we consider a biblical definition of hope, we are talking about a hope that is a sure hope. A hope that demonstrates a confident expectation of receiving what God had promised, has promised in his word and what God has promised the believer in the future. This is a hope that's grounded and founded in the word of God and is considered biblically a virtue. Friends, this is not a wishful hope, a hope-so hope, or a hope and hope. A believer's hope is virtuous because it is grounded in the faithfulness of God toward his people. It is a sure hope that God is present with the believer in every and all circumstances of life, from beginning of life to the end of life and into eternity. And not only is a believer's hope grounded in the faithful promises of God, a promise of God, that God will keep all his promises, God is the object of a believer's hope. We see this in Paul's life. And we see this in this first letter, chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Well, friends, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter as we continue. Uh, basically, this is the second message from a series we're doing uh, called A Living Hope in 1 Peter. So 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll be reading together the first five verses. Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3. Blessed be the, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his mercy, great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Verse 5, who by God's power 
are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, as Peter uh, accounts here in his uh, letter for the living hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we look forward to this message, Lord, set me aside. May you be speaking clearly by your Spirit to our hearts and minds. And may we be obedient to what you are asking us to do or showing us. And may you change and form and shape us to be more and more like Jesus, more and more even today. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, as we begin to take a closer look at this text, we are reminded today that Peter's letter began with the characteristic greeting that we find in the New Testament letters. Peter introduces himself as the author of the letter. And Peter was writing his letter, we see here in verse 1, as one who was called by Jesus to be his commissioned and divinely appointed apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1. And the Apostle Peter was writing his letter to the elect exiles dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. The Apostle Paul, Paul, I almost said, I got Peter and Paul mixed up here, so hang in there with me. The Apostle Peter writing to followers of Christ. Here in verse 2, Peter said, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. You know, last week we dealt with some of the theology, verse 2, But today I want you to notice with me in verse 2, in one short sentence, Peter highlights the doctrine of the Trinity. Here in verse 2, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And with this in mind, the Apostle Peter would follow up his Trinitarian statement, if you will, with the phrase here in verse 3a, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the Apostle Peter using a familiar phrase that was found, we find elsewhere in the New Testament. For example, if you went to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, there the Apostle Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The same thing that we have here in 1 Peter. So between verse 2 and 3, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ in a nutshell. For God the Father, as the Apostle Paul put in his letter to the church at Ephesus, said, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Paul would go on to say, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to his will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. My friends, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, was planned and purposed by God the Father before the creation of the world. Think about that. That's quite amazing. And according to the express sovereign will of God the Father, this um, gospel was made manifest in and through the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Who, as Peter reminded his readers here in verse 3, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's stay here at verse 3. The Apostle Peter's praise continues of God when he said, according to to his great mercy. Question for you and me, whose great mercy? Short answer, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we should not skip over this particular place, this place that Paul, this Peter describes, see, I'm going to confuse Peter and Paul here, pardon me, uh, skip over the great mercy of God is what I'm trying to say. You know, how often you and I go to straight to the promises, the blessings, the gifts, if you will, instead of spending time with our great and merciful God, who is the object of our hope. See, what we have here is part and parcel of the doctrine of God that we uncover throughout the Word of God. You know, you go from Genesis to Revelation, the Scriptures declares the mercies of God. For example... Moses, in what is often called his last will and testament, said this, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. We go to King David. We find him there in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. He's convicted of a sin for disobeying God, for he had gone ahead and, and dead a census of Israel. And he said this, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. 
but let us not fall into the hand of man. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 14. We move along to Daniel the prophet, who prayed for Israel. He was pleading with God that he would have mercy on his people who had rebelled and disobeyed and turned against the commandments of God. Here, Daniel praying to the Lord our God, belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. We go to the New Testament to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Titus, who said, But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. According to his own mercy. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. And God's mercy, my friends, have been made, has been made, had been made manifest when the Apostle Peter said, Here he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's press pause for a moment. Please notice with me the term born again. When you think about that term, what do you think? How do you think about it? Peter uses the Greek word translated in the ESV, which I'm reading from, born again twice in his letter, here at verse 3, and you'll also find it in verse 23 of chapter 1. And this term born again has over the years has become quite a popular and often used term by Christians. One might hear someone say, I am born again, or, or one might ask someone, are you born again? Or one might challenge someone, you must be born again. So what does born again mean? The original Greek means uh, to produce again, to be born again, born anew. Well, let's, to get some handle on this, let's turn to John's Gospel. That's the first chapter of John's Gospel. The Apostle John there described that Jesus Christ is none other than the one and only God-man who is, according to John, true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John chapter 1 verse 9. John here using metaphorical language to describe Jesus Christ who had been sent by God to who? To his own, John would say, and yet his own people did not receive him. John chapter 1 verse 11. And John would go on to say to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he, has give, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, this is important, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. Again, John using metaphorical language here, describing how one is born again. So from John's introductory comments, we can see with certainty that the apostle Peter's use of the term born again means one who is what? Born of God. That is, God is the one, as the Apostle Peter said here in our text, verse 3, that has caused us, you and me, to be born again. His readers in the first century to be born again. Whereas John put it back in chapter 1, verse 12, to become children of God. So in summation, the term born again is a language the New Testament uses often metaphor metaphorically, to describe, as the Apostle Paul put it in his letter to Titus, the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Again, we're back at Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. We go now to John chapter 3, and there we find Jesus in his conversation with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, uh, who put, it in, put this born-again uh, term in another way, in response to Nicodemus's question. You see, what, what happened is uh, Nicodemus goes to see Jesus at night, and he asks someone, he asks Jesus, not someone, I'm having problems here, hang in there, folks. He, he asks Jesus uh, a question, and then Jesus said, you must be born again. And then Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mom's womb and be born? And Jesus answered Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. So as we put all this together, we can say that the term born again is the means by which God, in his mercy, regenerates or renews a person from the inside out. And it is done through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That a person receives... As one commentator put it, quote, the new birth, a spiritual, 
holy and heavenly birth that results in our being made alive spiritually. As you ponder all this, let's take a moment and consider the first century audience that Peter was writing to. First, we see here Peter's audience were what? They were born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 3, these were believers. And these first century citizens, these first century believers, were followers of Jesus Christ who were undergoing, according to verse 6 of chapter 1 here, various trials. These believers had been dispersed throughout five Roman provinces, present-day Turkey, and they were enduring, according to Peter, sorrow while suffering unjustly, chapter 2, verse 19. These believers were being, as Peter put it in chapter 3, verse 9, reviled, in other words, hated. And Peter would go on to say that they were also slandered in chapter 3, verse 16, and that they were maligned in chapter 4, verse 4, and they were insulted for the name of Christ, chapter 4, verse 14. And that these kinds of trials and sufferings and tribulations for their trust in Jesus was, according to Peter, common throughout the world. Chapter 5, verse 9. Well, friends, this is the context in which Peter writes a letter to encourage and speak hope into. Well, Marshall Segal, uh, in his article for, uh, for DesiringGod.com, said of our current and Christian context, quote, as a follower of Christ, Pardon me, this life will not be easy or comfortable. Seagal uh, was reflecting on Peter's letter, and he points out the difference between being born again to a living hope that Peter mentions here at verse 3, and the distinctly different kind of hope from what Seagal calls, quote, the other hopes we've known. Now, as you ponder this, can I ask you some questions? What do you hope for? What do you hope for? And have you ever been dissatisfied for, for when whatever you hope for, pardon me, whatever you hope for has no longer, uh, uh, didn't happen or fell through? How about this question? Do you find that your hope is primarily grounded uh, in the things of this world? Your place, your, you place your hope in the temporary things of this world. And now my question again is, it moves on to how is that working for you? You know, it doesn't take too many spins around the sun to understand the things that we hope for in this world often do not come to fruition. And if we continue to hope for things that will never come true, what's the point of hoping at all? That's the question that's before us. No, my friends, the believer's hope is not in this world. That's not the kind of hope that Peter was pointing to here in his letter. Peter writes about a hope in God that is far removed from this world. The believer's hope in God is first a historical moment in human history. As we have already read together, the believer's hope is a living hope that was fully realized on a Roman cross some 2,000 years ago. Remember verse 3 where Peter said, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think about this. Think about all that Jesus endured during his passion and accumulating with his crucifixion, death, and burial. Think about three days later, Jesus rising to life. Many would see him and be with him. Here was the power of God on display. Jesus, my friends, is alive. And here's the point. When you are facing trials and tribulations, and not if, but when you are persecuted for your trust in Jesus, Remember, brothers and sisters, remember, my dear friends, that your hope is a living hope, a hope that is grounded in the living Jesus Christ. Segal closed his his article by saying, if Jesus lives, you will live. Well, time is not our friend as we move through verse 4 and 5 here, but a few points can and should be made. So bear with me. First, a believer's hope, when we think about a believer's hope, it's not found in the things of this world. Peter couldn't be clearer about this. A believer can expect trials and tribulations in this world. Secondly, a believer's hope is located in the future and to another time yet to come. And Peter here in verse 4 and 5 encourages readers to look to that future as Peter described here at verse 4 to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's verse 4. 
So Paul in his letters to the Romans, we go to Paul in his letters to the Romans Church, chapter 8, they're reminding the believers in Rome that the Holy Spirit, Paul said, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and have children than heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with them in order that we may also be glorified with them. And Paul would go on to say, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You find that in Romans chapter 8, verse 16 to 18. And thirdly, we go back to Peter. Peter goes on to say that the believer's inheritance is being kept in heaven for you. Then chapter, then verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, it is we are saved through faith alone. We go back to John's Gospel in chapter 10. And there we find Jesus and his disciples. Uh, they were in the temple and they were surrounded by Jews who challenged Jesus to prove to them once and for all that he was the promised Messiah, that he was the Christ. And Jesus responded to these Jews that he had been doing this all along. That all that he had been doing in his father's name was a witness to the fact that he was the promised Messiah. Yet with the evidence before them, they chose not to believe. And Jesus went on to say that those who didn't believe were not his sheep. Jesus using the uh, sheep and shepherd metaphor here. They were not his sheep because his sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Well, friends, as we ponder together Peter and Jesus' comments, please notice here in verse 5 the term being guarded. I just want to highlight this for a second here. This is a military term, and Peter uses this military term to do what? To underscore the security of the believer until the end. If you have the NIV, it translates the Greek as shielded, the New King James Version as kept. And friends, whether guarded, shielded, or kept, Jesus was clear in his conversation with the Jews in the temple that his sheep will never perish. No, my friends, none will perish. And God's power is proven to keep the believer's inheritance. For Jesus said, my Father is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Well, friends, I want to share a story uh, from uh, across the pond here from Canada. I don't know where you live, but there's another place in another time of 2020, August 2020. I want to share the story of Pastor Inthi from Laos, who was imprisoned in August of 2022 uh, for his faith. And I want to also share a little bit about his wife, Kamchai, and his son, Kiko. So Pastor Inthi and his family are, are from a staunch Buddhist village in Laos where, where a belief in any other religion is looked upon very lowly. It's uh, as uh, described in, in the story that I read, deeply frowned upon. So Christians in this village are considered traitors to the cause, I guess, and supporters of really disunity and offenders of the traditions of their faith. Inthi's wife, Kamankai, uh, Chamankai, and you know how to say that name. I'll be changing it all along. Just hang in there with me. 58 works as a farmer to help support her family. Now they have nine children, seven boys and two girls. Quite a large family. Three are married and the rest live with her. The oldest son is 30 and the youngest is 14. So it was back in August of 2020, Comanche, Comanche, pardon me, Kamankai was informed that her husband was imprisoned. She'd been waiting all day for her husband to return from the rice field and was informed by a neighbor that her uh, police had arrested her husband. She went on to say, quote, when I heard all this, I fell to my knees getting weak. I felt my knees, pardon me, getting weak and I burst into tears. I prayed to God to have mercy on him and protect him from violence and harm. I was unable to eat or sleep that night. See, folks, this was the third time that Pastor Inthi had been arrested for practicing his faith. So his wife was obviously feeling frustrated over the situation, but yet despite her husband's incarceration, she uh, hung in with her faith, 
Even when her family had to deal with her, dealt with her badly, uh, these are non-believing relatives of hers, her family would often ask her why she had to stand firm and believe Jesus Christ when all it did for her and her family was lead to suffering and persecution. They even said to her, renounce your faith so that you can live peacefully. And she responded, I will never abandon my faith because only Jesus Christ can bring me joy and happiness. I will continue to believe, continue believing in Jesus. I will follow in God's footsteps and I will trust him in, and trust in him and him alone. Then we have the son, Kiko. He's 17 years old, seventh in line. He spoke about how he looks up to his father and has confidence that God will take care of him no matter what. He said this. Kiko said, I believe what happened to my father is part of God's plan. God wanted to spread his kingdom through my father's persecution. Each time my father came out of this prison, he proclaimed the word of God more strongly. I am a witness of a growing number. I am a witness of a growing number of believers. Right now, Kiko said, there are seven villages that my father is providing a spiritual support to. God always looks out for his children. He went on to say, he always does. He did it now with my father the first time, and he will continue to do so in the future. I feel that God is always with us. Even during my father's absence, God gave my mom the strength to support the family so that we would never go hungry. Pastor Anthony was, Anthony was released after about six months of imprisonment on that third time. Well, I don't know what trials or tribulations or struggles or whatever you're going through right now, but I want you to remember as a, as a, as a believer what Jesus said. Jesus said... My Father is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for Peter. We thank you, Lord, for Paul. We thank you, Lord, for all the New Testament writers. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Genesis to Revelation and the revelation of God and his Son, Christ. And I pray for my friends who are listening, my brothers and sisters, Maybe even those who have not have yet to believe. Maybe even those who are suffering like uh, Pastor Inthi and his family. Persecution, direct persecution. I pray for all these, Lord. I pray, God, that they would turn their hearts and their minds towards you. That they would trust your son, Jesus. That he is faithful to keep his promises. And Lord, one day this will all be said and done. When Jesus comes, he'll set all things right. And then we will be with you forever on the new earth, the new heavens, celebrating as the people of God. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more trials, no more tribulations, no more sufferings, no more nothing like that, Lord. Oh, Lord, that will be a fine day indeed. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.